Welcome to Inside the Vault with SWP. Join Mark Yaxley as we explore the latest news, reports, and some bullion basics for investors old and new. Let's get to it. Happy Wednesday, everyone. Welcome back to Inside the Vault with SWP, a weekly show where we dive into the world of precious metals and precious metals investing. If you've joined us before, thank you for your support. If you're new to the show, welcome. You can find all of our previous episodes on ANCAP Radio's Twitter account or posted on the SWP YouTube channel. While you're there, check out our Inside the Vault series on YouTube, which is one of the most viewed channels on precious metals investing on the web. We are incredibly excited to expand Inside the Vault into podcast form with ANCAP Radio. So thank you to them once again for hosting us. I'm your host, Jeremy Barlow. I'm excited to be with you again today. We've got a great show in store. We've got a very special guest with us today. Bob Moriarty joins us. He will be with us in just a moment. Uh, but before we bring Bob up on stage, let's go to Mark Yaxley with his weekly market update. Mark, what do you have for us? Hey, Jeremy. Yeah, really excited to have Bob on the show with us today. He's one of my favorite people in the industry. I've known him for a long time and really looking forward to hearing his thoughts. You know, relatively speaking, this this week has been much, much quieter for gold and silver as opposed to last week where we saw that meteoric rise and fall of the gold price. I think right now both gold and silver are in a consolidation phase after nearly a month of solid gains, which I consider normal behavior following such a strong period. Gold is currently hovering just below 2000 US an ounce and silver just below uh, $23 an ounce. Investors are now awaiting the news, the November CPI numbers, which actually are just coming out, and results of several major central bank meetings happening this week, including the Fed and the European Central Bank announcements. These meetings will provide us with fresh clues about the likelihood of interest rate cuts early next year, hopefully, for us gold and silver investors. In other news, Ukrainian President Zelensky was in the United States urging them to break a deadlock over funding uh, with regards to his country's conflict with Russia during a visit to Washington, he warned that the current funding debate only benefits President Putin and risks his country's ability to push back against Russian forces. Uh, also in uh, war news, uh, sorry that there's so much of it these days, but public support for the war in Gaza appears to be diminishing by the day. Uh, a lot of rallies and a lot of rioting going on in the United States, particularly at some of the major universities. President Joe Biden has stated publicly that the public opinion in support of the Israel war against Hamas, sh sorry, he said could be shifting. I say Reed is shifting. However, he stated we will continue to provide military assistance until they get rid of Hamas. I'm really looking forward to Bob's comments on these wars because he's fought in Vietnam himself and has written uh, ex extensively about war and conflict. And finally, there's a lot of red numbers in commodities. Uh, as a whole, at the moment, oil is in the midst of a two-month losing streak. Uh, rare earth metals keep falling as well, and there's strong outflows from gold back ETFs at the moment. Meanwhile, the price of spud potatoes, uh, the darling of everyone's Christmas dinners, is rising sharply amid terrible weather in Europe. So I thought I'd end on that little Christmas note. Well, as soon as we finish uh, filming here, I'm going to run to the grocery store and pick up my potatoes uh, for Christmas. Thank you for that, Mark. Um, Let's bring Bob on. As Mark mentioned, uh, he has written extensively, uh, not only about, um, about war and conflict, but also about uh, finance and investing. Bob Moriarty joins the show today. He's the author of Finance and Investing Guides, as well as chronicles of his own experiences as a U.S. Marine pilot in Vietnam. He's also the founder of 321 Gold and 321 Energy, which feature articles and updates on global events affecting both sectors. Bob, welcome to the show. Well, it, it's a real pleasure, of course. I'm just meeting you, at, and I've known Mark since Christ was a corporal. <laughs> well, it's good to have you back on, and uh, we've really been looking forward to this one. Glad that we could make it happen. Before we get into your kind of macroeconomic outlook and gain some of your insight there, I think I'd be a remiss to not touch on your accomplishments with the U.S. Marines. Uh, going through your bio, I was just absolutely floored. You're the youngest naval pilot to serve in Vietnam at 20 years of age, where you flew 100 or 824 combat missions. You also hold 14 international aviation records, including 
the flight time from New York to Paris. And you're also, and I watched a video on this, you're the third person to ever fly through the Eiffel Tower, which is, the, the video is incredible. If, if, if you haven't seen it, go to YouTube and check it out. Um, how do you come to start, you know, providing commentary on the particular sectors that you do coming from your background? I don't know. I mean, that's that's a really good question. It's nobody ever asked me before, you know, why are you doing or how are you doing what you do? I don't know. But uh, Barbara died four years ago. And unfortunately, other than taking my dog out for a walk three hours a day, I have a lot of time to do research. I, I'm a speed reader and that helps we have access to more information now than at any time in history. And it behooves all of us to look at the alternative sources of information because basically everything we're told by governments now is a total lie. Every, everything about 9-11 was a lie. Everything about COVID was a lie. Everything about the Ukraine war was a lie. Everything about the Gaza war is a lie. So if you want to know what's gonna, going on, you're going to have to do some research and learn to think for yourself. But the world is in an especially precarious position now, uh, financially, geopolitically, so so it's an opportunity uh, and a risk at the same time. OK, well, let's let's dig right into that, because you say we're in a very precarious place financially and politically. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But firstly, you know, off the back of Mark's market update just now, 2023 has been a pretty good year across a variety of asset classes. I want to get an idea of what you make of all of that. I understand that, you know. Recently, you had talked about you thought there was a, an impending financial crisis coming in September to October of this year. We seem to have, you know, gotten through that relatively unscathed. What sense do you make of all this? Uh, strange enough, that scares me more than, than the idea of a crash. We are going to have a crash one way or another fairly soon. The world is awash in debt. And it is quite simple. All debts get paid. They get paid either by the borrower or by the lender. And I climbed out on a limb and I took a chainsaw with me and I saw the limb off behind me and I predicted a major market crash in September and October. And I was 100% wrong. So I've been looking since then trying to figure out what's going on. And with all the, the very real problems in the world, when you look at the stock market new highs, you have to say something doesn't make any sense here. And someone sent something to me today that terrified me, but it gave me an answer. I, I, I wish I could quote the numbers, but going back to 2019 until now, 2019, 20, 21, 22, 23, the hedge funds are using derivatives to increase their cash flow. And the increase in the use of derivatives it's been like five or six hundred percent. So what these guys are doing is they're going out in the stock market and they're buying shares. And that's why the shares are going up. And then they're selling puts and calls on them. Uh, derivatives are the most dangerous financial instruments that I have ever heard. And no one really understands them. Uh, two thirds of derivatives are interest rate based. So when you have the largest, fastest increase in interest rates in history, uh, somebody's getting hurt big time. But using puts and calls on these hedge funds to to generate extra income, I, I'm trying to think of a good way to put it. Uh, 
the theory of derivatives is that if you spread risk, you decrease risk. When in fact, if you concentrate risk, you increase risk. Uh, the de derivative time bomb has, has been going off. It's what caused the crash in 2008. And, and it's going to blow. Okay. The one thing that we know, if you take a balloon of any size and you keep blowing into it, sooner or later, it's going to blow up. Now, it is going to blow up. And it seems to me that the increased use of derivatives in the stock market by the hedge funds, it's probably what's behind the stock market increasing. But uh, when you look at the underlying, the, the foundation of the stock market, and this is interest rates in general, this is treasury notes, this is subprime loans for automobiles, this is the the real estate market, the commercial real estate market, the foundation of, of the general economy is so shaky now that it should terrify everyone and anyone. And I'll give you a little pitch here. The reason I was the very first person to deposit gold and silver with SWP, I, I'm going to preempt uh, Clark. No, we weren't the first. We we were among the first, but we weren't the first. Uh, th this is a really good time to think safety. And I believe, of course, that gold and silver are an insurance policy. And it's something you, you absolutely want to make sure it's safe. And I certainly see, Barbara and I moved to Grand Cayman, let me think, 18 years ago. And, and we saw what was happening in the United States, and it scared us quite bluntly. I think the United States right now is totally out of control. It scares me to think of the election next year. Uh, Greg, uh, McCo not not the coach, McGregor believes there won't be an election. So, so we're in for some interesting times. Now, when I was 20, I was actually the youngest fighter pilot in the entire world. And I looked at really old guys like you guys, and I thought, God, I hope I never get to be that old. I hope something happens to me. And I am really old now, and I look at young guys like you, and I think, we've screwed it up for them, but they're going to have to sort it out. Well, you don't look you don't look a day over 20 with with the beanie on. Let me tell you that much. You, you, you've definitely embraced your your inner youth. Um, I want to just take a step back. You mentioned a debt based system just a moment ago, uh, and you believe there's a conflict going on between what you call this debt based system and the resource based system. And I just was hoping you could unpack that a little bit for our viewers and and and, and give us an idea of what that means to you. Okay, there there are two systems that are in conflict right now in the world. There is the debt-based system of the West, and the person who has written about this the most and does the best job is Michael Hudson. And I would highly encourage people to go to Amazon, look up Michael Hudson, and read his books. He's written two books about the debt-based system. Basically, in the, the Greek and the Roman empires, landowners, uh, peasants would borrow money because they had a bad crop or somebody was sick or something happened. And when they couldn't pay it back, they literally were put into slavery and lost everything they had. In a debt-based system, the banks end up owning everything. Now, the whole World Economic Forum thing is really about the elite's attempt. They want to own everything. How do I know this? Because they say by 2030, you and I were, were the, the useless eaters. will own nothing and we will owe nothing. But the 
unanswered question that everybody needs to ask themselves is, well, gee, if I don't own my car and I don't own my house and I don't own my clothes, who does? Somebody has to because they're still going to exist. And of course, in a debt-based system, the banks, okay, the elite, the oligarchs, the filthy rich, the George Soros, Bezos, uh, Zuckerberg, those guys are going to own everything. So you've got the inherent conflict between the banking system and the useless eaters, which is us. And then you've got the reactionary force, which is the people who sit on natural resources, such as Russia and China. And, and they're saying, we don't want to be part of this. We don't want this constant death cycle. We don't want these constant wars. And it's very clear that there's a giant conflict going on right now between the debt-based system of the West and a resource-based system of the BRICS. Now, in my opinion, okay, and it's only my opinion, and I could easily be wrong. I have been wrong two or three times in the past. In my opinion, the debt-based system is crashing, and, and when it crashes, it's going to take the standard of living of Europe and the United States to a level that's just unimaginable today. Uh, we have spent too much. We've been the richest society in history, and, and it's all done on borrowed money. That's very sobering, um, and but at the same time, it makes sense. And I mean, every time we see the the U.S. debt ceiling get hit, the can gets kicked a little further down the road, and it just it kind of raises the uncertainty a, a, a little bit higher. I want to kind of uh, I want to ask you what kind of indicators, what kind of events lead you to believe that we're headed for a crash? What can the everyday person look at to to monitor this? What are the catalysts? that you're closely monitoring? Uh, the problem is there's too many of them. What I'm looking for, it's a relational thing. I, I want to see things that indicate we're either a very healthy society economically or we're a very sick society economically. And, and quite bluntly, the Ukraine war is one of the best examples. Prior to uh, 2022, the world, the West, understood that Ukraine was the most corrupt country in the world. The United States goes in 2014 and spends $5 billion in a coup d'etat. And they want to oust the pro-Russian democratically elected leader, and they want to bring in their own thug. By 2019, Ukraine more or less has, has has fair elections, and Zelensky runs on on a platform that he's going to end the conflict with Russia, and he's going to decrease or eliminate the, the corruption. And of course, that's exactly the opposite of what's happened. the The Ukraine war is the dumbest war the United States has ever participated in. I think the total amount of money that the West has spent on Ukraine is something like two and a half, uh, $250 billion, a quarter of a trillion dollars in a war that there was no chance whatsoever that Ukraine ever won. Now, I can prove to you categorically how stupid it is with one comment from Blinken, okay? Did you happen to listen to him in the last day or two? I haven't seen anything. No, please enlighten me. Uh, this literally happened in the last day or two. I don't think it was yesterday. I think it was two days ago. But Blinken said that the Ukraine war has been a win-win for the United States because at low cost to the United States, we, we inflicted damage to Russia. Well, if it's a win-win for the United States, what would you refer to it as for the 600,000 dead Ukrainian soldiers? How many of them would think it's a win-win? 
Yeah, it's a good point. And you also mentioned low costs as well, which I don't know how much money has been pumped into there, but it's been not, I wouldn't call it low cost. Well, uh, the, the increase in the United States debt, public debt, was $500 billion in one month, okay? We're talking about numbers that are so silly here that the, the Biden administration is going to go down as the most corrupt, stupid, idiotic administration in history. First of all, Joe Biden is not running it. Obama's running it. He's got his little minions running around. Obama's back in Washington. And Obama's really pulling the strings. The idea that Joe Biden is capable of running the most powerful nation in the world is simply absurd. If, if anyone in Congress or the Senate was actually serious about running a free country, that would say, hey, wait a minute. We've got a, a, a government headed by a guy who is absolutely, totally senile. He can't walk across the stage. He can't speak a sentence. And you can like Joe Biden, you can hate Joe Biden, doesn't make any difference. The guy has passed it, okay? So how do you have a powerful country run by somebody who's passed it and you don't? The United States is an empire in decline. Everybody gets 75 to 80 years of the world's reserve currency. It was true of Rome. It was true of Spain. It was true of France. It was true of the UK. It was even true of Russia. They all collapsed. At the end, at the United States, it's collapsing now in these constant wars. I, I was in Vietnam. I, I went over there. I don't think I was 20. Let's see. I was actually 21 when I went to Vietnam. And of course, back then, we had very limited media. And, and we believed everything that we were told. And it took me being over there almost 20 months before I realized, wait a minute. I mean, we didn't we just take this hill three months ago? I thought we took this hill. Well, we did. And then we left. And then we came back. And then we left. And then we came back. And I thought, wait a minute. This is just a joke. And it's gotten to the point now. There's no justification legally for us being in Syria. And Congress just voted to stay in Syria. But there no one has ever said what basis were being there. It's illegal, okay? They got a democratically elected government that's a lot fairer election than anything in the United States has had lately. And, and we're over there stealing their oil. You can't do that. All empires end when they start fighting wars that they don't have to fight. And this thing in Gaza, uh, the UN believes it, it's ethnic cleansing and a war crime. The EU believes it's ethnic cleansing and a war crime. Biden says there should be a, a two-state solution and the Israelis are killing too many civilians. E everyone agrees that it's a war crime and nobody does anything to stop it. And the real danger with Gaza is there are so many players involved. You've got Lebanon, you've got Syria, you've got Iraq, you've got Iran, you've got Turkey, you've got the Hutus, you've got Egypt. 17% uh, of the world's energy goes through the Red Sea, and the Hutus, who are the rebels in Yemen, are attacking shipping. Now, you don't actually have to sink any foreign vessels uh, to cause everything to stop. As soon as the insurance companies refuse to, refuse to insure cargo, then, then you just won your little war. So there are so many different players and everybody's got their own agenda. And, and still in the background, you have to look and say, this is obviously a conflict between the debt-based system of the West and the resource-based system of the East. China believes there should be a two-state solution. Russia believes there should be a two-state solution. So there's a lot of players, and it could spin wildly out of control into World War III, and then we all lose. 
That's fascinating, Bob. Thank you for that. And just, you know, the, the question leading into that is, was what can the everyday investor monitor to, you know, get an understanding or at least prepare themselves for a potential financial collapse or issue or situation? My follow-up question to that is then, how do you go about preparing yourself for such a thing? And, uh, you know, I don't mean to fear monger or cause, you know, hysteria or anything, but how does a regular kind of run of the mill everyday person prepare for the unknown financially and, and otherwise? Uh, that's a good question. I think the best answer is to pretend that you're in Miami and, and you've got a hundred and 60 mile an hour hurricane that's about to hit. We are going to have a financial hurricane period. I, I was wrong about September, October. I'm not wrong about it happening. And there's many, many, many people who see this. You are absolutely correct that the government keeps kicking the can down the road. But one of the, these days, they're going to kick the can and they're going to find out that it's been filled with concrete and they're going to stub their toe. The rate of increase of the U.S. debt is so uh, grandiosely out of control that, that that has to be serious. The Chinese property market is blowing up. And you've got trillions of dollars at risk there. The Japanese financial system is blowing up and they're about to go into hyperinflation. So bad times are coming. Pretend it's a hurricane. It's just economic. This is not a time to go out and speculate. It's a time to hunker down. I, I keep extra food. I keep extra fuel. I have substantial investment in gold and silver. I do have a lot of investing in, in resource stocks. We're in for some tough times. And I think that's a good thing. And here's why. This is something that was predicted in 1999 uh, uh, by two authors at the fourth turning. And they said sometime in the first 10 years of this century, there would be a fourth turning, and this would be the crisis stage. And this would be when many governments are trying to become totalitarian. And in response, there will be individuals who will start speaking up and speaking out, who will be fighting for independence rather than totalitarianism. Regardless of people how people feel about Elon Musk, uh, what he's done for social media has been absolutely heroic. Uh, Zuckerberg and and all all of the guys, uh, even the, the the Washington Post, Bezos, uh, these every everybody wants to censor opinions. You were not allowed to have an opinion about COVID. Okay, if you spoke up, say, wait a minute. These things are not even tested. You know, why are we rushing through this? Why are we forcing people into shots that, that have not been tested? And the answer is they, they, they were going to shut you up. But then we find out years later that the government was working directly with the social media companies to silence people. Uh, the direction the government has gone uh God, I don't know, really in the last 20 years, it's very scary. It is absolutely unconstitutional for the United States government to try to silence opinions. And they want to pretend that by working through Mark Zuckerberg or, or Twitter that, that they weren't uh, functioning in, against the First Amendment, but they were. The United States was spending billions of dollars to try to silence people. And those cases are all going to court now, and the government's going to lose. But we're at a very scary time. So it's very important that people hunker down, concentrate on what's important, not go into debt, and not speculate. I, I personally wouldn't touch the general stock market with a 10-foot pole. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's certainly hard to do after the last couple months that we've had, you know, making making new highs across the board in the stock market. And that makes perfect sense. I want to, uh, you know, I was going to ask about current metals pricing and where you think we are right now. You know, obviously, we just hit all time highs. We've retraced a little bit, but I think you just nailed it. You know, 30 seconds ago, you said don't speculate. And as part of preparation, owning, you know, um, some some physical metals is certainly a good idea despite what the price might be today or tomorrow, think a little bit longer term. Um, what I did want to ask you, and this is actually a question from, from the audience, is you know around your best practices for exposure to metals. Um, this uh, uh, question in particular was surrounding, you know, why would uh, an investor hold their metals in a different jurisdiction versus you know, holding them in their home or you know, at a vault location within the United States? You know, how would they use those metals if we go back to the gold standard or if the U.S. dollar, you know, disappears overnight? So just, you know, give us a, an idea of your best practices for investing in, in metals as part of your portfolio. OK, there there is a I'm trying to think of it. There is like a triangle that somebody came up with a relative safety and uh, physical gold and silver were right at the top. They were the most safe. Now, uh, I, I always get in trouble when I say this. There are a lot of people who want to worship gold and silver, and I'm not one of them. Uh, gold and silver investments, just like anything else. Uh, however, I, I view them as insurance policies. Now, let me ask you a question. I want to answer within five seconds. How much do you pay for insurance for your car? It's relatively inexpensive here in the Cayman Islands. So I think it's about $500 per year. Okay. You had to think about that a little bit. And the reason you had to think about it a little bit, because it's not particularly important. Okay. <laughs> no matter where you are, you got to have insurance. Okay. It's that simple. And how much you pay for it is meaningless because, okay, why do, why do you have insurance other than the fact that it's required? In case I get an accident. Do you want to collect? Uh, if, if I do get in an accident? No. Nope. Okay. You go down, you take 500 bucks down, you pay your insurance. Do you want to collect on that insurance? Uh, I, I suppose if I needed to, yes. Well, no, no. Okay, Here, here's the deal. There's two alternatives. One is that you need to, and obviously you want to collect them. But if, if you don't need to, do you sure. want to collect? No, you don't yeah. want to collect. When I pay insurance, I want to, I, I get a bill right here. Let me see how much it is. Uh, I get a bill for insurance for... 469 euros and 76 cents euros. I don't want to collect. I want to throw that money away. Okay. Because that's why I have insurance. If my house burns down, first of all, I hope I get out. And second of all, I, I, I want to make sure that I collect on it. But I, I want to look at that at say sunk cost. So my initial investment in gold and silver is insurance against financial chaos. I don't want to hear about, well, gold's the only real money. Don't, don't give me that bullshit because I don't care. Okay. It's an insurance policy, but there, how much can you safely or rationally keep in your hands? And the answer is not very much. Okay. I have access to physical gold and silver right here, okay, but not that much because then it would be risk. But literally, you know, when when we talked to Mark years ago and Shane, we were among the first five or 10 people to, to uh, uh, bring gold and silver to the vault, okay? And, and strange enough, I, I don't think there's any question about it now, uh, geopolitical risk and, and geographical risk is very real and, and market chain were at exactly the right place at exactly the right time 
And I think uh, Cayman is one of the safest jurisdictions in the world. Uh, there's Hong Kong, there's Switzerland. And, and strange enough, all of those uh, places have issues of some kind. I know that banks in Switzerland use to sell gold and they store gold. Now they're telling their customers, you gotta go pick up the gold. So, so uh, jurisdiction is very important and, and quite bluntly, I'm, I'm a great salesman. Of course, I get 10% on all this, don't I? Uh, I? I'm a great salesman for you guys. I mean, we've been there as long as SWP has been there, we've been customers. Awesome. That's great, Bob. Thank you for that. I want to turn it over to Mark for his weekly bullion basic segment, but stay with us, Bob, because I think he's uh, he's going to draw you back into the conversation. Mark, what do you have for us today? Okay, yeah, hang, hang, on, hang, on, hang on just a minute before you do that. Mark said that goals rocketed high to a new high and then made a perfectly normal correction. And I happen to agree 100%. I think it was absolutely correct when he said that. No, thanks, Bob. I take that as a compliment. Now, perfect transition. Bob said a minute ago he was a salesman. And this is a true story. So Bob, he's already said he's a client of SWP. Bob has bought and sold with us a number of times in the last eight years. I use him as a reference for other large clients of ours to try to time the market. I have found that Bob has been the most accurate at picking the right moment to buy gold and silver over the last eight years. I'll give him full credit for that. He has amazing market timing. And literally I'll say, I'll, I'll contact some other large clients of ours and say, Hey, Bob bought today. <laughs> so like, forget all the market analysis you're reading out there. Forget what I say, Bob bought today. And so my question for Bob is, and instead of doing the Boolean basics, I'm flipping the Boolean basic segment over to Bob is Bob, if you had to answer the question, when is a good time to buy? What what are you doing that has been so accurate, I'll say, uh, over the last eight years that you and I have worked together? You're able to time your purchases really well. And that's a question that comes up all the time for, you know, everyday investors. Like, when is the right time to buy? So what does Bob Moriarty know that the rest of us don't know about timing his purchases so well? I, I'm like Colonel Sanders. <laughs> I, I, I've got my 11 herbs and spices secret. <laughs> you, you want me to tell you what my secret is? And we have, I mean, we probably made 20 or 30 uh, purchases and sales. But I, I've got a secret weapon. You know what the secret weapon is? What's that? You. <laughs> so he's not no, giving this. No, this is no, this is no kidding. Okay, uh, I, I'm a contrarian, and and I follow fifteen or twenty different things that give me a general feel for the market. But you guys have your finger right on the pulse. Okay, you call me up and say, "Hey, Bob, you know somebody's got five thousand five thousand ounce bars of silver for sale." And I'll look at the price and realize that whoever it is is selling a loss, okay? Pe people are very foolish investors. They want to buy at the top and they want to sell at the bottom. And if you can measure sentiment accurately, it's very easy to time things. And believe me, you're my secret weapon, okay? Because, you know, we sit there and watch silver go to 30 bucks an ounce and it comes back to 18 and you call me up, some say somebody's got 5,000 ounces for sale. I'll, I'll try to figure out how to buy one or two of those bars. And I don't think I've ever sold anything at a loss. There are times that I actually am not even sure. I, I don't think there's anything that I bought from you that it, it was at a loss. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, so I, I think what yeah. Bob is, is, is getting at, and I, I can't take all the credit because I am I will reach out to him once in a while, but to his credit, he often reaches out to me to inquire. So um, what he's saying is when most people are selling, 
And and this, you're absolutely right. That's what tends to happen. People, the price falls a little bit, then you know, you kind of get the water waterfall effect, and everybody starts to selling. And at the bottom of that, that's usually when Bob picks up the phone or drops an email because he recognizes the market trend is heading in that direction. But instead of him panicking, he's like, Oh, that's an opportunity. So that is this week's Boolean basics is be a contrarian, think for yourself. And and when everybody else is selling, that's probably a good time to, to contact us and ask us if we have any deals. And usually we do, Bob, because everybody's selling. So we're like, well, there's lots of metal available. And that's the best time to call your precious metals dealer. So thanks for that, Bob. I appreciate the answer. Well, let, let me give you a perfect example. If you go back to the year 2000 and, and 2001, gold hit 262 in August of 1999. Silver hit its low at 402 in November of 2001. Uh, we were living in Miami, and I would go into my coin store once a week and chat with him and see what was going on. And he had literally hundreds of 100-ounce silver bars. Had, had them stacked up. So silver, silver is like four bucks an ounce, four and a half bucks an ounce, five bucks an ounce. And I'm seeing all these silver bars. And I said, John, who, who's selling all this silver? And he said, well, you're going to laugh, Bob. These are the guys who were buying it when it was 50 bucks an ounce in, in 19, January of 1980. And I said, Really? That's got to be the bottom, okay? It is the nature of people that when things are going up, they get very optimistic. And when things are going down, they get very pessimistic. But here's why it's stupid. Let, let's say you, you need a new BMW. And you go into your BMW dealer there, and the car that you want is $40,000. And you think $40,000, that's a lot of money for a car, even a BMW. I'm just not comfortable doing that. But you go in there a week later and he's having a Christmas sale. It's now $20,000. What do you do? Yeah, I might buy the BMW for 20. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. If it was a good deal at 40, it's a better deal at 20. I am looking at a hundred stocks right now that are absurdly cheap that are down 50 60 80 90 percent yet they have substantial value nothing has changed except the price and i try to make the point in my book ignore the mob the mob is always wrong you have to be a contrarian if you will buy when things are cheap and you will sell when things are expensive you do very well it, it's that simple. And people people want to make it complicated. They think, well, that price of silver has something to do with interest rates. It has something to do with the stock market. It has something. No, it doesn't. It has to do with sentiment. Okay. People buy and sell stuff because of sentiment. So if you can measure sentiment, okay, you can be very profitable. Mm -hmm. That's awesome, Bob. Thank you very much for your time and insight. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, for those that are watching and you want to uh, to follow Bob a little bit more closely, head over to 321gold.com or 321energy.com. Uh, tons of interviews with Bob on the internet on YouTube as well. So check those out. Uh, that is all for us today. Thanks to everyone for listening to ANCAP Radio for partnering with us. And once again, to our guest, Bob Moriarty, for joining us. Thank you very much for your time, Bob. Good job. Uh, we, we need to do this more often. I thought that Mark didn't love me anymore. <laughs> Jesus. I, that is certainly not the case. I can assure you of that. Uh, we'll definitely get you back on in the new year. Uh, Inside the Vault will actually be taking a brief hiatus for the holiday season, but we will be back in 2024 with more content. So please do stay tuned. Uh, for more information on precious metals investing, you can visit our website, www.swpkman.com, or head over to the Strategic Wealth Preservation YouTube channel. Until next year, happy holidays to you and yours. Stay safe and happy investing. Thank you for listening to Inside the Vault, the podcast that opens the door to precious metals. 
We hope you learned something new and enjoyed the show. See you next time on Inside the Vault with SWP.